you always think sales is on the hook for revenue. But these tools that we force on sales and into the sales stack, in my opinion, it's really important to say like who, we brought this tool in, so who's going to be accountable for the results? And the results can't be adoption because you can force a sales rep to do something that's useless. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is not only a good friend, but it's someone I'm excited to talk about because of her 20 plus year tenure in the technology industry. She understands the plight of sellers and leaders. And by starting with the customer, she simplifies the sales process and removes obstacles for her revenue team. VP of Global Revenue Operations and Enablement at Optimove, Cassandra Anderson. Cassandra, yeah, thanks, so. good to have you. Yeah. Awesome to be here. I appreciate that introduction. You, I've learned a lot from you. I've gotten to have some really good, challenging, but fun discussions, right? As a, as a marketer in the technology space, I always love it when I get to talk to prospects that, you know, they understand the space, they knew the nuances, they've dealt with them. And the conversation goes far beyond just the surface level, what's on a landing page to really, how does this work? in my environment. You've always been someone that makes that real. So great to talk to you and uh, excited to see where EQ falls in, in all of this and importance for you. So to jump right in, in B2B sales today, you know, what is that one soft skill? I ask all my guests, what's the one soft skill that's creating an impact both in the relationship side which is why you and I are here today, right? But also in driving revenue, because at the end of the day, that's what business is all about. So I would have to say communication and take that a step farther to say communication and understanding. I like that second part because communication without understanding is just, as we know, noise in today's market, right? And there's a lot of noise. <laughs> oh, there is, there is. As we were just talking before we jumped on, you know, the amount of emails in our inboxes every day and LinkedIn, all of the in-mails, all the, all the different noise, how every website seems to sound and look the same these days. How do you cut through all of that? And as a seller or someone who enables those teams and works with those teams, how do you teach your sellers to find that understanding? Well, I think to, there's a, the most important part is active listening. Mm-hmm. So we aren't actually taught how to listen necessarily. And there's a lot to break down here in, in what I mean by active listening. One of the things that we did at OptiMove was we brought in a consultant, training consulting firm, uh, Paul Bramson, and he teaches listening as a framework. So we'll call active listening, listening and acknowledging and clarifying and explaining. So he calls it LACE. And so we use the LACE framework. We teach our reps how to really active listen. But it's it's really important more than listening is at some point you have you have to, you know, be in the world of them. It's not listening to agree. It's not listening to disagree. It's not listening to respond. And that is a lot of times what we've learned by doing or watching or participating as as we've grow. But this is active listening. So it's listening to really get in their world and and ultimately understand what they need. And then as in sales, the whole goal isn't to sell something unless the person really needs it. So how do you make a difference in the life of that person over there? I think that's where sales has changed so much. If you look at, you know, you go back to the old school books of, of selling, like when it was truly not in a digital format, but very relationship driven and kind of the, the, the professional salesman type thing, you know, gets up with their briefcase every day and meets their clients in office. That's not happening as much anymore. 
And we're all really informed. We're not getting a new product because that salesman showed up in our office and I never heard about it before. We've all looked, we've been marketed to, we've been educated. We have all these review sites, all these places to go see. So I like your idea of understanding more of where the buyer is at and less of understanding, do they understand what I'm selling? Do they understand what I'm telling them? No, like, do I, as the seller, understand where my buyer is and what their needs are? That's right. I mean, gone are the days of the true hunt. Buyers are very well educated before you find them in the hunt state. Like We hunt them and they're already educated. They know oftentimes the problem that they have, they're looking for a solution for it. They've educated themselves on the solutions available to solve those problems. And, and now you're being brought in. And so who wins the deal is someone who has really heard, not just heard, but also not just heard in a way that like, oh, I heard you say, but more like, oh, I hear your pain. This is what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is that what would make a real difference for you is if you could listen to the, well, use your product. So you could know in advance, like what's costing you business and where sentiment matters and how your customers are re- receiving your sales team, right? Or something like that, right? So you you hear past what they're saying into the pain and, and into the solution. And you kind of bring that to bear. And yeah. that's what, that's, what's going to make a difference. Yeah, I, I like that because I think what you're at, what you're listening for is not just what they're saying, but you're actually listening for, to me, like like those those subtle cues that we get when we're maybe a little easier, maybe face to face, a little tougher sometimes over video, very tough when like presenting or four different, ten different people are on a on a screen and we're trying to look at the little little squares, but <laughs> it's you're trying to turn it around and really understand where that buyer sits. So how do you get to that understanding? You talked about in in one of our last conversations, it was clarification and getting to agreement. Take me through kind of that whole idea and then how it applies in the sales process. Well, firstly, life is created in agreement. And I use that all the time. When someone in any kind of relationship breakdown, Mm-hmm. You know, if, I, if I'm talking to a rep and maybe the rep's having a problem with the, the prospect or even the critic in their deal right now, you have a buying committee and there's usually someone who wants your competitor. So it, any, it could be in life, like, oh, someone's having a, a difficulty in relationship with their spouse or with their children, right? And as you, as you lead people, you care about that side of their life as well. So I say this a lot, life is created in agreement. And what I mean by that, is relationships, you can always find in a breakdown in communication, really where, or any relationship, a breakdown in any relationship is rooted in three things, intention, expectations, and communication. And since we're talking largely about sales and technology sales and EQ in in that arena, let's let's talk about it in that respect. Mm -hmm. So you have an intention as a seller to (laughs) sell some stuff right? To be effective at your job, to feel successful. Like that's your intention, like by and large. And a buyer has the intention of looking like a hero at their company, being able to solve some big problem, right? That's the, their intention. So, you know, when you can align the intention and effectively communicate, that's the third part, right? So we have intention, expectation, and communication, effectively communicate the expectations that are a direct result of your intention. Mm -hmm. So if my intention is to solve a pain point, then my expectations are that you're not going to give me a 10 minute PowerPoint, a five minute brief about your company. You're going to ask the questions about your product that can solve my problem. And then you're going to show it to me. (laughs) So, you know, If you don't do that, if your intention is to talk about your product and tell me why you're the best and like in your expectation is to be able to go through a scripted sales process, which, hey, I'm in sales rev ops and enablement. So my job is to script the process for a rep, right? (laughs) I'm not knocking it, but 
if the intentions aren't aligned and the expect the expectations specifically derived from the intention aren't aligned, there's going to be a breakdown. And that's just the simple fact of it. And what that breakdown can look like for you as a seller mm -hmm. is that they move on and buy from your competitor who listened. Yep. And did the demo. Yeah, and, and then didn't do the demo and let you also probably see whatever it was you wanted to see rather than let me take you from, you know, start to finish everything about my platform in 45 minutes. Okay. Did I wow you? Or are you impressed with me? Right. <laughs> Which is, I think that the, the, the other side that we get every single day, because I find most enablement programs don't focus enough on mapping the accounts giving an idea of what a good account looks like, going through a company's 10K, going through their, you know, year strategic deck and what their initiatives are, especially because public companies, it's so easy to find this stuff. It's like they don't map through that stuff and talk to a sales team about, okay, here are the people in the room. Here's how they might feel. Here's probably where they sit or what they might feel about competitors because these companies have already been talked to by our competitors most likely. Sales enablement's never focused on that in the in the sales enablement groups that I've worked with and been a part of. It's always focused on let me tell you the five things our product does. Let me tell you the ten features that support those five things. Oh, and let me tell you these use cases. So I want you to go out and I want you to hunt down these use cases, yeah. and then insert X product. Well, at least, I mean that's more developed than a lot of enablement, which is more like, <laughs> hey, are you filling out? Are you, are you filling out these fields in sales in Salesforce? And let me chastise you if you haven't. And by the way, I'm going to listen to your gongs and tell you everything that you did wrong or your, <laughs> or whatever call recording solution, yeah. right? Like I'm going to listen to my cue for sales and tell you. <laughs> that doesn't work though. Right. But I think it's, it's, you know, one reason why we're taking a different approach at Unifor is like, understanding is at the core of what we're doing. We, we came out with a new slogan this year for all of our, our solutions. One big AI platform for enterprise understanding. It's for AI powered. Like that's it. It's at the end of the day, understanding as you're talking about unlocks a lot of these challenges, a lot of these friction points. That's right. Whether it's between collaboration internally, because now I don't know about you, I've never seen a seller go from start to finish, talk to a prospect, close the deal and never have to work with legal product, um, marketing, customer success. <laughs> and how do you get all like, it, there, there's also the understanding internally that's so tough. And I go back to your, your comment on CRM. Does the CRM data get you the information you actually friggin' need? <laughs> Not usually. I mean, we, we, in RevOps, like our goal is to make that information available to reps. And, you know, I think if I was like painting the perfect CRM picture, like, if you uh -huh. did, like a CRM that doesn't exist today, right? Yeah. It would be something that absorbed all the, comp all the conversational intelligence out there. Yeah. It absorbed every email. The AI looked at it all and said, hey, have you, this is what's going to make a difference suggesting a few bullet points just to sometimes we don't see what's in our blind spot, right? And, then, and having a tool like absorbing all the information from all of these different touch points could be really helpful. And then based on that, propose propose a proposal format or, or like the deck that I'll use to present my pricing. Uh, there's just, there's so much we could do. One of the things that I'm working on right now is We've in our methodology out roll out to sales reps last year, we said, you know, there's whatever qualification tools you use, a band, which is kind of old, or, or yeah. like medic, med pick, right? Yeah. Like whatever you're using to qualify these people. Um, and then there's the pain point that you're uncovering that we already talked about because people don't solve, I mean, people aren't buying software other than to solve a problem. Yep. I have a, a whole soapbox about that too. We could we could pontificate about. I have a whole a whole soapbox about people buy software thinking it'll be a silver bullet, uh -huh. but they don't. They don't buy software with the with an owner, like with somebody who's going to own the rollout and the results. 
They yeah. don't pre-map the process. Like there's all this stuff that they don't do in advance that makes software rollouts less effective. Given that I'm in the software buying business and the software selling business, I get to see both sides of that coin. But that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> well, I don't know though. I'm curious. I want to dig into this for a second. If you have five minutes, right? Get on the soapbox. I want to hear, okay, what are your five things? If, if somebody is going out to either, I'm going to say it this way, because I think in this economic time, I'm either going to remove or add either way. What are the five things I must do before I make that decision to either remove or add? As a buyer, a software buyer? Yep. Yep. Well, I mean, I'm in the, I'm actually in this boat right now looking at some to our stack today. Okay. So the, the first thing is that I look at. So one thing that I must do is I must look at who will actually own the results, right? Because everybody wants to increase revenue. That's why we buy tools, right? So is that every, yeah. every start of every website boost. <laughs> Boost revenue. I mean, you're really, you're either trying to cut costs, increase profit or increase revenue, right? Yeah. Ultimately. So yeah. I don't, is it, there's probably some other things in there, but ultimately they go back to one of those three things. So, so if that's the ultimate outcome, you know, it, it goes back to what, what is the software going to impact? How are we going to measure it? So that's the first thing, figuring out what's going to measure, how are we going to measure it? then who's going to be responsible for it? Who's going to be, who's, whose feet are on the fire for the, the results? Internally? Like, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and, and I would, I would think, you know, you always think sales is on the hook for revenue, but these tools that we force on sales and into the sales stack, in my opinion, it's really important to say like who we brought this tool in. So Who's going to be accountable for the results? And the results can't be adoption because you can force a sales rep to do something that's useless. You know? oh. Right? And oh, then, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they, they, you see it all the time where it's like, oh, you have to have this touch point or, oh, you have to do this thing or, oh, and that touch point's not helping anybody, but we're doing it anyways. That's right. And, and it's tough to measure the effectiveness of all the little things that you do, but when you get good at measuring those things and you can say, this is the thing that really is converting and kind of eliminate some of the other noise, speaking of communication and noise, yeah. that's, that's a good thing. So the, one of the things I always try to do, so in my top five, I would, I would like the sales reps to have to learn as little as possible, you know, like, so if I can keep something in their same environment, single pane of glass style, I would opt for that versus a best of breed tool most of the time. Because, yeah, I mean, a best in class tool is fantastic. You have 14,000 features that are amazing. Yep. And you're using six of them. And if you're lucky. <laughs> because and you have to enable this that. is so true with most tools right like it's a, and not even just like it's 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 so true with most things in life i think of a kitchen the same way that's right like, i mean i have a tool that just does only one thing in my kitchen right like that's not that see? helpful yeah. yeah i like that so so you would go platform wide over best in class i would for, and for a number of adoption. reasons simplicity of adoption, the, you know, there's no, the, I think there's a book out there and I can't quote who wrote it, but it's that basically multitasking is a lie. Yeah. And so when you have all of these screens, like, like what do you call it? Swivel chair? Is that like the old term for it? We yeah. have all this swivel chairing that happens, then there's the waste. There's so much waste. And we I have think- a stat. 77% of your time as a seller is spent on non face-to-face, non-interaction, not selling to somebody like all the other junk. That's right. That's wild. It's wild. And, and we add tools in there to try and improve productivity, yeah. but there we have to measure the drag on productivity simply by having the tool. And that's tough to do, but I think it's not impossible to do. I like that. The, the metric of drag. That's something I, I read that recently. Actually, Gardner was talking about something similar. It's how they kind of frame. So you're on the cutting edge. So Gardner was talking about drag and how it's like rep drag, right? Like just 
slowing you down to reach your full potential. In ops and enablement, that's your role to some extent reduce or eliminate that drag. Has you've been you've been working with a lot of teams, you've scaled organizations. Have you seen tools really eliminate drag or overall, or do you think we've just increased drag exponentially over the last few years? You know, that's a great question. I I don't think I've seen tools truly eliminate drag. Now there's some things that tools do very, very well. Like, uh-huh. you know, I guess one place where a tool would eliminate drag is, is finding valid prospects to go hunt. It would be hard to do that. We used to do it in the olden days. I was five then of not literally knocking on doors. We would go to the top floor of a 20 story building, work our way down. And whoever made it to the lowest floor before getting kicked out by security (laughs) is like, what is this? And, you know, not supposed to solicit in tall buildings (laughs) or anywhere, you know, it's like, uh, that was the way. Yeah. So, I mean, I think in that sense, there's been some reduction in drag. You can get to more people sitting at a sequencing tool, like an outreach tool of some sort and blasting through a hundred prospects in an hour. And that would have taken a lot longer before, you know, there's a, there is some reduction in drag when you use a tool that can do a marketing automation and not just marketing automation, but personalization at scale, which is maybe a tiny little plug for OptiMove. But when we do B2C, we're B2C, uh, yeah. our product is to consumers. So, but. But that's the, that's the way things are going. I mean, B2C is a great model. You, you bring that up in the personalization at scale. I think, you know, we're all, we all live in a world where social media is, is predominantly covered in ads. And a lot of the B2C space is all about intent and I'm looking at this mountain bike or I'm looking at this widget for my whatever, right? And I need to place that ad right after they've gone off that website in all these channels. But B2B is moving that direction too. Man, I seriously wish it would. (laughs) Here's the thing. So we obviously we're a B2B company, right? Our software is designed for B2C marketers. So let's think retail for a second. Okay. And, and I wish everybody I shopped from used our tool. And this might give you like goosebumps as a buyer, okay? Because if, if every company who tried to sell me something, right, mm-hmm. knew what my preferences were in a way that was meaningful, knew my last purchases. You know, I, I buy t-shirts from Old Navy because they're so soft and they're like, you know, twelve dollars. Okay, so there, I love them. value to price range, like quality to price. We're right there. Love them. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, we, I just wear them under suit jackets. You don't even see the whole T-shirt. It just feels super soft, and they're they're cuddly, and I like them. They're hey, cheap. shout out for those T-shirts. Yeah, that's right. But I buy zero else from there. Like literally, not buying anything else. I'm buying soft T-shirts from Old Navy. That is all. And then they email you a big packet, right? Every about jeans. Week. I get so many. I unsubscribe. So I'll buy something from them and then I somehow get magically resubscribed. And then, and then I, and then they send me gene ads. I'm like, no, why, why? You, trying to cross sell you. You have my purchase history, you know, <laughs> like, you know what I buy. Why would you offer me anything other than soft, cuddly shirts? <laughs> but if you offered me a discount, I would buy more shirts because I'm going to wear them. Yeah. Yeah. So, my, my, my point is we can know everything in real time. And this is what I, as a software buyer, I want customer, I want that kind of personalization from yeah. the people selling to me. Why know do you me. think it gets so, why, I like that. Why do you think it gets so hard in B2B? Or what do you think some of the pushbacks are in B2B? Is it the, is it the buying group? In fact, there's only six or eight people that determine that, that I'm not the consumer and the buyer necessarily. I think that's part of the the hardest part of personalization in B2B is that you're selling to a bigger group. Yeah. If you think about a great big company like Intel or something, right? Yeah. And, Massive and, organization. Right. So, and the buying group for this, for your software might be only 100, 200 people in the organization of, of I don't know how many employees they have, 20,000 or whatever. Mm-hmm. So how do you, 
you can't, if you personalize your message to the, at the company level, you might really miss the mark. And so it's probably safer to do general marketing versus personalized marketing. Now there's some personalization you try to do like, oh, well, I know Tim's visiting my website. Let me say, hi, Tim, you know, or creepy, oh. whatever creepy thing you're doing. But <laughs> uh, and, and there's like some creepy factor to wanting these brands to really know me, but but I would rather them know me. You know, we have, we, our motto is, we believe brands that start with the customer build loyalty for life. And I think that's very true. And I mm-hmm. look, I think that's true even in business to business it is. because people feel understood then it goes back to, yep. they feel heard. I, you're, you're spot on. I, it, there was a, a statistic we were doing surveys. I've talked about this on a few shows now, but it's been great data and, and the gap between you know, what a buyer wants on a sales call and what a seller actually usually offers, that delta is massive. And it usually sits where the seller is on the product side. Here's here's my product, here's my wares. Let me show you, you know, all my watches and all my things. Yeah. And the buyer's just going like, I, I've got a watch on. I, I don't need to tell time. I've got other issues, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's that gap between understanding my business and just telling me what your product does for a use case. I think where buyers want you to go is understand my business. So to your point, like personalization then becomes harder because it has to be more research backed. Like you don't have to go to me and say, Oh, Tim, I know that you, you know, got married and did this and did this and did this. So here's your perfect product. Like I've already given you that intent most likely on a consumer side. Right. But I think on a, on a business side, you have to come in knowing, hey, there's eight people in this room. I know you all have this objective. I know you probably all have different timelines. I'll take um, Brent Adamson said this really well. It was, and I'm going to, I don't want to butcher it because I loved what he said, but it was um, objectives, tactics, targets, metrics, and timeline. You have to align all of those buyers, all of those people in that decision on all of those things. And it goes back to like what you were saying, which is understanding and setting the expectations, like clarifying and coming to an agreement. That's right. Well, and that's the thing because everybody's intentions in that room is like, are likely different. Yeah. They might have, they might want the same outcome, yep. but the intention, their personal intention is it can, could be unique. You know, mm-hmm. they you know, maybe for their department, they want to spend less time on something. They're like so strapped building sequences that, or, you know, marketing automation uh, journeys that like, that's all they spend their time doing. And they really want to be creative instead, right? They think being creative will actually increase revenue. And their intention is to spend less time building journeys and more time being creative. The CMO might have like, they need a lead conversion, right? So they're, they want, yes, be creative, but also get those journeys built, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Also, can we can we get the intent data that we need? And by the way, can we personalize the messages? How can we personalize them? Right there, they have all the little things and all the juggling in the air. And they want to know, like, what's our cost of acquisition and how do we bring that down? And what's, you know, how are we converting? And where's where's the loss of MQL to SQL? Like where, mm-hmm. you know, so they that's their intention is something totally different. And now the outcome is we need a software to solve our problem here. We've identified a problem. So that's where listening and kind of clarifying, asking clarifying questions and acknowledging their separate pain points and getting the expectations out on the table. Like what does good look like to you? Okay, great. What what would it look like if it were better? Mm -hmm. Not best. Let's not even shoot for best. What does better look like to you? Because there, if we just get better every day, you yeah. know that. I mean, one percent better, right? There's a lot of comments that talk about that. The one or the two percent club. I, I was reading a recent thing, um, totally off topic, but only two percent of people take the stairs, right? In the really? world, that's an interesting stat. That just statistically, everyone else take the escalator, or take the elevator, whatever. Two percent of people take the stairs, but it, it goes back to. Like 
small things of difference, like can make a massive difference, right? Because that personality trait of taking the stairs is going to make you deal with different things in a different way. 1% better each day is going to give you the growth that you want, but it, like it, we all have different objection objectives of what we, what 1% better looks like or where That's we're right. trying to go with it. Um, right. It's, it's an interesting thing when you bring eight people in a room and try and sell the same solution to them all. And I think your, your idea of, of finding that agreement, that understanding kind of clarifying is, is critical. Absolutely. If I said, you know, in the beginning of our demo, I said, hey, what I heard from our first two conversations was rather than starting with a question, actually, right? Because I don't know about you, but I go into a demo and then I spend the first 20 minutes like on introductions and like being peppered with questions. That's really common. Mm -hmm. And then I get the 15 minutes about our company. And at the, then they're like, well, let me fit the whole demo into 15 minutes. I'm like, yeah. we could have just started at that because I've done my research. I don't yeah. really need you to tell me. I'm already <laughs> connected your to your CEO on LinkedIn and I'm, I'm seeing what he's posting. And yeah, we're right. an idea of this. But how powerful would it be as a seller if you came in and said something to the effect of what I heard you say was that you want to spend more time being creative. You want to get CAC down, right? And now I'm talking to the different buyers. You want to get CAC down. You want conversion up. You want revenue up. If we could address these four issues today in the demo, would that, whatever the question might be, move if we can address this, would that move it forward? You want, and this is not an open-ended question. It is a yes or no question. Do we have agreement on what the next step is? And will that move the needle? <laughs> and then you just shut up, right? Like then you listen again, back to the act of listening, like just let them talk. And, and let there be some silence and awkwardness, maybe even in the room, because I think you did just set up a perfect conversation that then you get all of those decision makers. You've almost like fostered an internal meeting. That's right. And then well, you, and you, you get help them be in alignment. Right. Yeah. And, and then, it, and you're not undervaluing like, Hey, the creatives might be like, oh, well, I mean, the CMO wants to bring cap down. Doesn't really matter if our, um, if we get time, more time to be creative, you know, cause she's the CMO or he's the CMO, whatever. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I think, I think it gets everybody's needs addressed too, in, in, in a way that is, it has agreement, you know, and people can move forward and feel positive about having their own intentions, but being on board with everybody else's needs being met as well. And you can facilitate that as a salesperson. Imagine, imagine as a seller, like the kind of power you're bringing to that team, just in your understanding of their needs. But I would give a caution here. And, and that's part of the LACE method, listening methodology is don't assume that you know what they mean when they say a word that you have a definition for. Awesome call out. Awesome yeah. call out. Because I think that's where also a lot of miscommunication is just rampant across sales, across marketing. Like somebody hears a word, takes it out of context or sees it differently. Like what, when I say a lead compared to when somebody else says a lead or when I say opportunity compared to what opportunity means to you or whatever else, like those are such charged words yep. that can have such different meaning in different parts of the same organization. Well, especially if they say something like we need responsive, we really need a responsive professional services team. Well, great. We do that. Sure. We're responsive. We have 99% yeah. customer satisfaction score, right? And that's your typical answer. But I don't know that the person feels heard yet. No. When you say you need a responsive pro services team, what do you mean by that? Like, get curious. Like, what do you mean? Clarify. Yeah. What say. would make a difference to you? Yeah. And if they said something like, we need a 24-hour SLA. And you're like, oh, we have this in the bag. Fantastic. Yep. So if we offered you an SLA of three apps, would that make a, would that be a meaningful? And then you remember that because it's okay to ask. We learned so much in early selling, like selling 101, never ask a close-ended question. But sometimes you really want that yes or no, because yeah. life is created in agreement. 
It's that makes sense. I think you you pull out a good point, which is working through and asking that next clarifying question to kind of really empathize and understand where they're at. And it's right. going to lead me to before I before I, I stop asking questions to you and, and start learning a little bit more about you. Um, it, it's it's going to be how does EQ play into this? Where do you see that fit in? Because we haven't got there yet, but I think this is all pointing towards yeah. social awareness, self awareness, empathy active listening like those are all the soft skills that as Richard Harris recently said those are the hard skills those are the freaking really hard skills <laughs> yes how does that all play in how do you enable that how do you coach and train to that you do a lot of listening yourself right and you do a lot of coaching from a place of self-discovery for them so one of the ways to have people so IQ is, it's rumored that IQ is relatively fixed, okay? It's at least there's a school of thought that says IQ is fixed. But EQ is not fixed. It's totally learnable, right? So you can, I mean, even to the extent that you might not have like the inherent social awareness, but you can learn to look for social cues, arms yes. folded, scowls, like you can be trained. So you could, EQ is trainable. Yes. Um, and, and social awareness or social cues, those things are important, but also like self-awareness, self-control. So you can train yourself. And I think coaching is really critical to that, but not coaching in the way that you're like, okay, Tim, I'd like to talk about such and such deal. And, um, I'm going to tell you what I thought you did wrong and here's how to fix it because what's more power, what's so that's your typical kind of coach. And maybe they cookie it in like, hey, you did this really good. And this is what I want you to work on. And you did this really good. And yay, let's go about our day. We'll look, talk about it next week. I mean, I think that's the Oreo cookie approach to coaching. It's really common. It's not terrible. I certainly like to get that feedback more than pure negative feedback. And I've had plenty of managers with zero emotional intelligence. And True. <laughs> just, just level me, tell me everything I did wrong and then send me on my way. Yep. Good yes, night. exactly. Uh -huh. Beaten down like a kicked puppy and uh, off the way. But, but really what's transformative, which means I don't have to beat it into them day after day, week after week because they have like an aha moment that becomes part of them is when they see it for themselves. So coaching is, um, uh, in my opinion, most effective when they discover the area of opportunity for themselves and they discover how to fix the area of opportunity or improve the area of opportunity for themselves. And you're there as a facilitator to help them along that journey of self-discovery that's transformation. That's powerful. I like, I like the idea of that guiding because, you know, we talk about that a lot of like a seller needs to be the, the Yoda, right. The, the guide, the, the person that kind of takes the, the prospect and, and helps them along their hero's journey. Right. It's okay. been said a lot in marketing, says so a lot in sales, but going back to that, if you're not coaching a seller in a consultative way, and you're coaching them on when this person says this objection, say this. When this person does this, do this back. You're not teaching them how to be consultative. Your training is not even consultative to help them learn. Like, and, and what we're really, I think, trying to foster is, you know, everybody wants to be the trusted advisor in their space. There's a LinkedIn post that someone was saying, I'm about ready to get rid of my sales team and just hire subject matter experts. Because all my SMEs have all these conversations all day long with people. They're open, they're honest, they're engaged, they're interested. Everybody seems learning. Everybody seems like they're, they're, they're getting value out of it. And it's leading to sales. But then I put them in a sales and in just calling it a sales conversation and putting in a sales interaction. And all of a sudden, the whole dynamic changes. There's, there's a really interesting challenge there. There is an interesting challenge there. I mean, words are powerful. So, I mean, are you, if you want them, if you want somebody to be a trusted advisor, then put them in an advisor role. If you want somebody to be in sales, put them in a sales role, right? If you want a salesperson to be a trusted advisor, like 
don't it's know. tough, that's right? That's a, that's a big gap to follow. But when you're selling to a client, right? Or when you're buying something, can you think back to the people you bought software from? You can either give them a shout out or not, but would you yeah. say you'd reach out to them and you'd be like, Ooh, I have a question on something like you're my place of advice. You're my trusted advisor in this software and this technology. Sure. I think for most definitely I, I, there's been lots of times where, I mean, actually I have, I have a Salesforce business capacity deck sitting here, right? I said, Hey, I want, I need something to help me think through all the areas where I should be at least looking at a business process or capacity from lead all the way to cash. And I, I want to workshop it and I want to see where the gaps are. And they came in consulting That's and awesome. brought, brought the cool deck. And, the, and then the deck is like, basically, here's a, fee, here's a capacity or a, a capability that you might want. And then here are all the things to think about around it. Here, here's a best practice kind of toolkit, if you will. And so sales, I mean, I, I don't use Salesforce today. Not that I wouldn't, but they were, I had a sales, a sales rep that I truly trusted to be a tr- my trust advisor. Yeah. And I knew that he wanted to sell me stuff. There was no doubt in my mind, of course. but he didn't want to sell it to me if I couldn't implement it and make it work. That's the key point. I think that's the point. Like, and that's where you become that advisor, because if you ever looked at probably switching CRMs or whatever it might be at some point at this company or another, you'd probably go, I'm going to reach out to him. I'm going to talk to him. Oh, for sure. I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, I say, I say regularly, well, Salesforce does it like this, right? (laughs) Here's how Salesforce does it. (laughs) And I guess as a marketer, I look at that and I think to myself, that is worth its weight in gold. Like as a market leader, like that's what you want. Not everybody's going to buy it every time. It may not be the right fit financially or whatever else or with the other systems or tools. But if you can be the one that's leading the charge that like people go to for your advice, like what a great position. Yeah. I mean, I think about Mercer for like uh, benchmarking salaries and so forth. Like Mm -hmm. I, I do. And I think you as a seller could provide the benchmarks and the best practices in your field. And that's a really good place to be a trusted advisor. And, you know, having someone want that information is, you know, get it again, back to getting their agreement. Would it help you would it help you if we provided yes. a benchmark in your in your space? Who's gonna say no? True. You want to give me thousands of dollars of free research? Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely. So then you can make more informed decisions. No, I, I think it's a strategy that's spot on. And the brands that seem to be doing the best today and, and positioned for the future are the ones that have done that. I, I yeah. agree. Oh yeah. Speaking, speaking to the future, what excites you about the future? What's something you're looking forward to in, in this whole crazy world of, of sales tech and, and revenue teams? Oh, I mean, so much is exciting about the future. And, and that's even in an environment where people maybe feel a little more trep, trepidation. I think that I've seen some sales surveys recently where across a billion transactions, you got to love big data aggregation. So across a billion plus transactions, uh, there's some co- there's some common themes. And one of the common themes is sales cycles are longer. So it's taking longer. Yep. Yeah. And the no decision, losing to no decision is, is up. And probably and, the toughest thing to lose to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the the win quo. rates are down. Status quo is the biggest competitor for sure. Yeah. Win rates are down and deal size is down. So you're like, wait, so it's going to take longer. I'm going to win less. Customers are going to do nothing more. And the deal size is going to be smaller. I can promise you pipeline is going to be affected across the board by all of those things. Yep. So I, so there's a lot to be nervous about, I suppose, right? There's something there. You see layoffs, tons of layoffs in the tech space, right? There's some, I think mm-hmm. people are are like reacting a little bit in fear. And, um, but there's, there's an excitement for me in the companies that don't give in to fear, that double down, that dig in, that invest in their people, like they are going to be the next market leaders in their space. And, and that's exciting to me, like who will emerge as yeah. the next market leader? And certainly it's going to be 
someone who has an AI approach, right? Yep. Yep. Like not buried, their heads aren't buried in the sand. They're not be reacting from fear. They're still taking risks. Um, and they they value their people. Those, those that's the company that's gonna to be the ones to watch. And that's exciting to me. I, and the fact that I have an opportunity to work for a company that sells to companies like that is exciting. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I, I I agree the same way. I think for me, it's um it's the excitement of seeing people look at AI and look at the potential and look at the capabilities. Like we were talking internally. OpenAI came out with ChatGPT and, and people get ultimately you're worried, right? Oh my gosh, this is going to change the entire AI industry. They've been able to do this and come out and all these things and all the hoopla that quickly. And I was like, I love it because for me, it's like, finally, AI has come out of the shadows and it's like, holy crap, it's real. Like, it's not just this algorithm sitting in the background. It's not like like now everybody realizes how real and impactful AI can be. So now it's like, gosh, the market awareness, the market education, like, thank you. Now I can have a discussion about what you can do with it and how amazing it can be rather than just trying to sell you on the fact that it even exists, <laughs> which for many years it felt <laughs> like that with AI. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is this AI or is this machine learning? And what is machine learning? Yeah. <laughs> is this just I mean, a- a yes, no thing firing in the background, but you're calling it AI. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just- I, I think a lot of it is mindset too about yeah. AI, right? And and look, I'm not saying there aren't risks to AI and we could have a philosophical discussion about, you know, the AI learning bias and all of these things, right? Like somehow humans aren't biased at all. There's nothing <laughs> to worry about here. <laughs> so, so, but putting that piece aside, like the like, is it safe or not? Because I can't speak to it. I'm not an expert in AI yeah. in that sense. And and we'll leave that to the, the philosophical geniuses. But, yeah. but I, I think coming back to the fear part, there's, there's a, a scarcity mindset, like, oh, AI is going to take your job. Well, or could AI create five new jobs for every AI model on the market, or 50 or 50 million new jobs or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Could we have an abundance mindset around what will open up, what will become available, right? And, you know, I think we can. I don't think AI is going to take more jobs than it creates. No, I think the best jobs are going to be like, like you said, how do I get out of doing the, the very minute stuff and leave that to AI and then do the stuff that's human, the stuff that's creative, the stuff that means relationships and transactions. So that's where, you know, my future bet is the, the human skills, the EQ, that's where our worth is. That's where you can't get that connection. There's a Michelob, uh, I love this uh, commercial. It was like three, four years ago, but it's probably more relevant now. It was an AI robot. He was doing all the workouts with everybody and running faster than them and hitting more golf balls. So all these people are like practicing at driving range, watching this guy hit perfect balls. And then the AI robot walks up to the window of a bar and the person that was working out all day is having a beer with their friends and laughing and smiling. AI can do all of this, but it can't do this. <laughs> right? like You're right. It's way more relevant today. <laughs> but I just love that because it puts a big smile on your face. Like, you're right. The people that can leverage it, take away the nonsense, take away the busy work, yep. focus more on the human part. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think, I think we were talking earlier about creativity. You know, you can still oftentimes tell, unless it's a very well trained language model what is, what is kind of flat and bland? It feels flat and bland still. And it, mm-hmm. it won't always, I'm certain it won't always. And there's a lot of good framework, but if you could use it to take up, like you said, 50% of your busy work in the day mm-hmm. so that you can focus on the things that are really creative and what matters, getting in there and understanding the underlying latent communication that they're not speaking. They're not even speaking it. That's like a language model can't, isn't detecting that yet today. Now there are sentiment models out there, right? So I'm not saying there isn't a sentiment functionality, but we as humans are taking in all the capacity for sentiment, language, uh, and even completely like maybe not even in the space of visibility. And we're taking that all in. We're filtering it through our own EQ and our own filters. That's why we need to ask clarifying questions. (laughs) 
and then we're creatively communicating. So I think the creativity is really key to keeping keep, keeping it fresh and not needing to worry about AI. Yeah, I think it keeps it human, right? People still buy from people at the end of the day. Yeah. That's what matters right now. Well, and in a product-led growth model, people are buying not from people, but, true, but, true. but people in the background are, are making the marketing that leads to conversion. And there's still people in the mix, whether it's like a bag carrying salesperson yep. or whether it's like a brilliant product marketer. <laughs> yeah. It's still, people are somewhere. still somewhere having to listen, right? Still somewhere having to ingest what others are feeling, thinking and, and wanting and, and provide. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So Cassandra, a lot about what we've been talking about in terms of EQ and sales. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you made the move to Reno, Nevada, right? Oh, where it snowed it for eight months. Crazy <laughs> snow year. Yep. Yeah. So last time we saw each other, we were in Mexico. The pandemic was just hitting and we didn't know if we were all going to get home. Um, <laughs> we've made it home. We've been home for too long. And so now what's, uh, tell me a little bit about what you're doing and, and where you're at. Well, we moved to the middle of nowhere, this beautiful mountain with very few neighbors. Luckily, we get internet because here we oh, are. There you go. <laughs> and it snowed for eight months. But before that, I was in Phoenix, where it was 119 degrees the day I left, or 46 <laughs> Celsius, if I did that math correctly. Um, and and so it's it's very different than that, but it's p- very peaceful. You know, I, behind me, this is, oh, you can kind of see, I have some yeah. paintings in the background. So I've, uh, I've been able to paint and I have a beautiful view to paint. And so a lot of reading, relaxing, going out on the jet skis, you know, what, now that it's very not fun. snow, although okay. it snowed Sunday. So I'm sure the lake will be extremely cold, but going to risk it. That's cool. Well, very fun. And so where can people connect with you outside of work? Well, the probably the best place to get me is on LinkedIn. Perfect. Uh, yeah. And you can find me at linkedin.com slash in slash the Cassandra experience. <laughs> I mean, that has been around for so many years when you still needed to have a personal brand on LinkedIn. So I just have never changed it. And now I get a good giggle out of it. Um, and or you can find me on optimove.com. Perfect. Yep. And again, Optimove, give us a quick rundown of what you're doing and who you're selling to. So if someone is listening and they're interested, we can get you a referral. Sure. Absolutely. So we believe brands who start with their customers build loyalty for life. So you heard me say that earlier. Yep. We personalize journey at scale with customer insights. We have an AI led orchestration. And all the cha- execution channels all in one platform. So OptiMove empowers brands to exhibit emotional intelligence when communicating with their customers. I so love, I couldn't I resist. Love, <laughs> hey, that's a good thing. We need more EQ in the world. I, I'm a big believer of that. Well, Cassandra, thank you so much. I know we're running out of time, but I, I want to say thank you for joining me. This has been a great discussion. A lot of fun Thanks. to have you. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Thank you. And and to all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of B2B EQ. Find us anywhere you listen to your podcasts or join us on YouTube and watch the whole video. Don't just get the audio, but get the visual cues, the reactions, the laughs and all the fun there too. And uh, don't forget to comment, like, and share. And we will see you next time for another episode of B2B EQ. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.